all right, I, I'm very excited to uh, to be here and, and to be talking to you guys. I, I really appreciate uh, uh, all the interest and and uh, I, I hope this is uh, this is helpful. Um, I, uh, like Jane said, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on uh, chat when when questions come up. Uh, it's a little late here. I'm not my most alert, uh, so I can't make any promises. But uh, there, there's plenty of uh, spots that we can we can pause and 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 kind of. Uh, uh, reflect on questions. Um, and I've, I've got some questions for uh, for y'all as well uh, uh, to to help uh, kind of shine some light on, on some of the, the things that we'll be talking about today. Um, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm, I'm Eli Holder. I'm a, a data designer and sometimes a researcher. Uh, my firm is uh, Three is a Pattern, and we help clients design and develop data tools that play nicely with humans. Um, and, and sometimes these client projects raise really interesting uh, research questions that that I get kind of hooked on, um, and then those uh, turn into whole research projects, uh, and and that's uh, that's that's what brought me here today. Uh, so almost every book on data viz uh, will start with uh, will will include one of these three charts. Uh, so these are John Snow's cholera maps, uh, William Playfair's trade balances, and and Charles Menard's uh, Napoleon map. Um, and so when, when people think of good data viz, uh, they think of these because good data viz is supposed to be intellectual and, and enlightening. And that's fine. Uh, but I'm, I'm personally much more interested in the, the non-intellectual ways that, that data viz can influence our, our attitudes and, and our behaviors. Uh, so for example, uh, these charts on the left uh, are, are, are pretty remarkable. Uh, they, they show that some impossibly high percentage of Americans uh, have, have basically become exercise crazed over a few years. Uh, and and the, the charts aren't pretty and they're not remotely true, uh, but they accomplish uh, something of a, a behavioral holy grail in that they, they get people to actually go to the gym. Um, so in, in a, a recent study of, uh, I think, 64,000 members of, of 24 Hour Fitness, uh, which is a, a gym chain here in the States, uh, uh, people who saw this increased their weekly gym attendance by 24%, um, which is pretty massive for something miserable like going to the gym. Uh, sorry to anybody who actually likes going to the gym. Uh, and so these these charts work uh, not not because they're they're beautifully designed. Uh, they they work because they're they're psychologically effective. Uh, they highlight a social norm that that people are are sensitive to, um, and and people tend to change their behavior to to match uh, uh, certain perceived norms. And then this is another chart that I've I've been thinking a lot uh, about lately, uh, thanks to a collaborator of mine, Peter Blakely. Uh, so charts like this can be influential, but, but maybe not in the way that you would expect. Uh, so what's remarkable about this chart is that by conventional design standards, it's it's a pretty good chart. Uh, it's it's clean, it's simple, it, it disaggregates, it draws contrast between categories. Um, and these are all good things to aim for uh, if this chart weren't about people, um, particularly people from marginalized communities. Um, and there, there are a lot of these conventionally good charts that, that show social outcome differences uh, between different, uh, different social groups or different racial groups. Uh, but instead of rallying support for more equitable outcomes like you, like you might expect, uh, these charts can actually backfire. Um, and so the, the way that they're framed can lead to uh, toxic conclusions about the people being visualized. Um, and so Cindy, Sean, and I uh, presented a, a paper on this at, at last year's Viz conference. Um, it has some some uh, wider implications for for visualizing social outcomes uh, that we'll we'll start to unpack during the talk. Um, but first, just to to get us into the right mindset, uh, I, I want to start with this question of uh, can information backfire? So what are some examples of of information that's uh, that's accurate and and well intentioned, uh, but but that's that's still harmful? Um, if if y'all have any ideas on this, uh, uh, feel free to to put them into the chat, and I'll, I'll go through a couple of examples as well. Um, so what, what are some unintended consequences of, of otherwise good information? Uh, if, it, it, as they bubble up, feel free to, to, uh, type them in. Um, uh, so one, one example, uh, comes from, uh, comes from the States, uh, uh, in Arizona's, uh, Petrified Forest National Park. Um, so they wanted to see if they could use clever signage to to try to persuade people uh, to stop stealing petrified wood from the park. Uh, this is this is a problem at the time. Um, and so one of the tactics that they tried was was basically a guilt trip. Uh, they they posted a sign saying many past visitors have removed petrified wood from the park 
changing the natural state of the petrified forest. Um, and this is this is accurate information. Uh, people were in fact sealing, um, and it, it's well intentioned. Uh, but this this sign actually leads to four times more theft uh, than if they just posted a sign saying, "Hey, please don't steal wood from the park." Uh, and so another example of this backfire effect uh, is from a, a study that we, we just wrapped up a few weeks ago. Uh, so political polarization is, is one of the big issues here in the States. Uh, uh, and, and so a lot of times in the news, you'll see charts like these showing these, these big gaps uh, between uh, conservatives and, and, and liberals on, on their support for different policies. Um, and, and what we found was that charts like these can, can actually make people more polarized. Um, and so news reports that attempt in, in good faith to, to try to characterize this big issue uh, might actually be making it worse. Uh, so again, accurate information, but uh, can make it worse. Um, and then finally, more, more relevant to our topic today, uh, uh, there, there's a common belief that, that raising awareness of inequality will, will uh, kind of directly solve inequality. Uh, and that's, that's often not the case, uh, or at, at least it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, so, for example, during COVID, uh, a, a few different studies found that the more that white people in the United States were, were aware of racial disparities in COVID outcomes, uh, the less willing they were to support public health interventions. Um, and they, they found that it didn't just erode support for more equitable outcomes, it actually reduced support for, uh, for all health interventions at the time. And so this, this backfire effect from, from comparing social groups uh, isn't isn't new. Uh, equity researchers, particularly uh, in education, uh, refer to this as, as deficit thinking or, or deficit framing. And this describes an effect where highlighting outcome disparities leads to essentially victim blaming. Um, so when people see that outcomes are different between groups, they assume that it's caused by some, some personal deficiencies uh, 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 of the group with the worst outcomes. Um, and this, this stereotyping effect is, is what Cindy and I showed in our paper, and, and we'll unpack how this works in DataViz next. And so our, our first big takeaway is that information can, can easily backfire, uh, even if it's accurate and, and well-intentioned. Um, and this is, this is probably the most important message that I can share. Uh, ideally, I'd like to make everybody just a little bit more nervous about putting new information out in the world, uh, especially if we're not sure how it will be perceived, and especially if it's information about people from, uh, from marginalized communities, uh, because information can backfire in ways that are hard to predict. Um, and so how do we avoid these backfire effects? Uh, I, I don't think that the world necessarily needs more rules about which charts are good or bad. And, and actually uh, some common conventions uh, can be uh, fairly harmful in this context. Um, I, I think the more important thing is, is that we understand how information is perceived in general. Um, and this is a question of, of psychology as, as much as, as it is design. Um, and so we'll look at, at two specific concepts from psychology and, and see how they play out in, in data viz. Um, and then at the end, if, if we have some time left, uh, we can walk through some examples that, that go through some, uh, some other quirks. Link to the paper. Uh, yeah, I can, I, uh, I'll share that towards the end. All right, so the, the first thing to unpack uh, are, are attribution biases. Um, in uh, uh, intro to psychology, uh, you might've heard things like the, the fundamental attribution error or, or correspondence bias. Um, and these are, are concepts from, from social psychology uh, describing how we form judgments about other people. Um, and, and this is important because it, it turns out that even when we're just looking at charts about other people, uh, some of these biases still apply. Um, and this is core to understanding how something like deficit thinking can play out in a chart. And so we'll start here. And Aaron has, has kindly uh, volunteered for this, uh, for this little bit. Uh, but we're, we're going to start with a quick exercise to, to try to wrap our heads around the concept. Um, so I'm going to describe a, a scenario to y'all uh, and, and ask you a few questions um, and, and feel free to, to put your responses uh, in, in the chat and we can see how, how kind of everybody responds to it. Um, and so uh, Aaron has volunteered. We're going to put him on the spot. Uh, and so I, I'd like everybody to imagine uh, that you are, you're out of town uh, and you're, you, you've just gotten some coffee and you're walking out of a coffee shop. Uh, and, and you look in front of you and there's a small park in front of you and uh, across the street um, and, and something moving catches your eye uh, and you stop and you look and you see Aaron is, is dancing very aggressively. Uh, and, and he's, he's also uh, wearing a, 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 a Hello Kitty t-shirt, it, it looks like, it, it's unclear. Um, uh, and, and you see that his phone is mounted on a small stand in front of him. And it, it looks like it's probably a TikTok dance of, of some sort. 
Um, and you're too far away to, to make out his expression. Uh, but but based on just the, the movements that you can see, he's he's clearly putting a lot of effort into this dance. And so the first question for everybody is uh, uh, why why is Aaron dancing? And feel free to to put some uh, speculative answers into chat. He's happy. He's happy. Joy bees because he enjoys it. He's an influencer. He's enjoying life. He's happy. He's taking some drugs. Just how I roll. All right. These are good examples. All right. Now we're going to switch it up. Uh, in this scenario, we're going to reverse it. Uh, we're going to say that Aaron has just walked out of a coffee shop, uh, and now he sees you dancing very aggressively in the middle of a park uh, in the middle of the day. Why are you doing this? Why, why might you be dancing in the middle of a park? Make a client happy. <laughs> Not dancing, a bug flew into my shirt. Uh, that is one of my jokes. Uh, thank you for previewing that. Uh, to embarrass my kids, that's a good one. All right, uh, these are these are all very good examples. Uh, so what we're seeing here, this this scenario uh, demonstrates the the this these attribution errors. Where typically when we describe somebody else's behavior, uh, we describe it in terms of their their personal choices or or their their personal characteristics. Uh, and so when when this question is is about somebody else, uh, people tend to answer in terms of personal attributions like. They enjoy dancing, or or they uh, they want the attention, or, or they want to be TikTok famous. Uh, but when the the question is reversed, uh, uh, people people when when the question is about ourselves, uh, the influence of of external forces are, are much easier to recognize. Um, and so we'll answer with external attributions like I lost a bet, uh, I was doing it for my niece's birthday, a, a, a bee was chasing me. Um, and so the, the the general idea here is that we're we're very bad at recognizing the external forces uh, that shape other people's outcomes and behaviors, uh, and so we assume that they're caused by them personally, as if the outcomes and behaviors are are entirely within their control. Um, and this this has some some weird implications for data viz. Um, and so let, let's take a second to to think about this chart on the left. Uh, this shows average hourly wages for four different groups of restaurant workers. Um, and you can see that, for example, Group A earns about seven dollars an hour more than Group B. Uh, so why is that? Why do why do we think that Group A earns more than Group B? More experienced group here in the U.S. Better looking, more skilled, unionized. I like that. Uh, all right. So a lot of times when people uh, explain these differences, uh, they'll explain them in terms of, of again, personal attributions uh, about the people within the groups. Uh, so for example, you might say that group A earns more because they're harder working, uh, they have better customer service, they smile more. Um, and these are, are pretty close to, to some real answers that we saw. Uh, but in, in reality, these differences uh, uh, are, are probably more reflective of external factors or, or at least uh, influenced by these external factors like how nice is the restaurant? How busy is the restaurant? Is it, is it in a, a wealthy neighborhood? Um, and so deficit framing uh, in, in this context for data viz uh, is presenting group outcomes in a way that encourages these personal attributions. Uh, it, it encourages blaming outcomes on people. Um, and this is a, essentially a version of, of the attribution biases that we just discussed. And so this is a problem because these group level personal attributions are essentially stereotypes. Uh, if you believe that these outcome differences are caused by uh, differences in personal characteristics, then you implicitly believe in, in a harmful stereotype that the people with the worst outcomes are somehow worse people. Um, and so we'll walk through an example of that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and so this is the same chart, uh, but we're changing the colors to emphasize a purple group A versus a blue group B. Uh, and you might look at a chart like this and your first read is average outcomes for purple group A are better than average outcomes for blue group B. And that's accurate. That's, that's fine. That's a, a good read of this chart. Uh, but a lot of readers will go further and explain the differences in terms of these personal attributions. 
so the, the takeaway becomes A has better outcomes than B because the people in group A are somehow better than the people in group B uh, in some way that would produce these outcome differences. Uh, and there's, there's obviously nothing in the chart that would support a, a causal conclusion like that. And then the, the real danger is that if, if you believe that the outcome differences are because group A is better than group B, you implicitly believe that the people in group B are somehow personally deficient. Um, and that's, that's obviously a problem. Uh, that, that's a harmful stereotype about the people in group B. And so to, to put this in, in broader context, uh, the, the, the deficit thinking effect suggests that even though charts like these only show differences in outcomes, uh, they can be misread as evidence for intrinsic differences between groups of people. And so we walked through this conceptually. It's, it's consistent with uh, uh, what we know about social psychology, um, uh, but, but how big of a problem is this uh, with charts kind of out in the wild? Um, and so these are results from uh, our, our last uh, few experiments where we tested uh, multiple different chart types showing outcome differences between groups of people like the ones that we just looked at. Um, and this, this chart shows the, the distribution of, of how strongly people agreed with uh, personal attributions like these outcome differences are because group A works harder than group B. Um, you can see that it's, it's, it's centered. Most people are, are, are uh, kind of in the middle of it. Um, but the, the gray area on the left shows people who disagreed at least slightly. Uh, uh, and the orange area on the right shows people who, who agreed with these personal attributions. Um, and so you can see that 53% that of, of participants uh, agreed with these personal attributions that, that essentially blame the outcome differences on, on the people themselves. Um, and, and since the chart gives no evidence for, for causal conclusions like this, um, uh, this, this implies belief in a harmful stereotype about the people being visualized. Um, and, and so this, this confirms that the, the deficit thinking effect uh, can be triggered by supposedly neutral charts and, and that it can affect uh, a pretty sizable uh, uh, part of, of audiences. And so our, our next big takeaway is that charts showing differences in outcomes uh, can be misread as evidence for, for personal differences uh, between people. Um, and this, this confirms that the, the deficit thinking effect can be triggered by otherwise neutral charts. Uh, I see a couple questions. Um, did you see something similar when presenting environmental explanations as well? Um, the we didn't present any of the the explanations directly uh, because the the questions in the experiment were multiple choice. Uh, we can it's safe to assume that they had both environmental and personal explanations on their mind, which is which uh, makes this. Uh, makes us a, a slightly, it, it, you would expect results to be more extreme outside of, of this experiment uh, because you don't have people reminding you of uh, uh, external attributions um, through the multiple choice questions. Um, but that, that is a, a thing that, that uh, we want to get into next, uh, or not, not next in this talk, but a, a, a research topic that, that's coming up and, and that uh, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot lately. Uh, can all charts be neutral? Uh, this is a whole different thing to, to kind of unpack. Uh, my short answer is uh, there's there's no such thing as a neutral chart, but that's a, a different talk. I uh, would be happy to unpack that at, at some point in the future. All right, next question or next section is uh, 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 next we want to look at, at how design choices can can impact this uh, attribution process that we just talked about. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about perceptions of, of variability in, in, in data. And so the, the world is, is obviously messy and, and complex, um, but that's, that's, it's hard for our brains to kind of deal with that. Uh, and so we like to simplify things. Um, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes we, we oversimplify things uh, in ways that can be misleading. Um, and it turns out that certain charts can have a, a similar misleading effect uh, that, that can look a lot like stereotyping. And so to, to understand how a, a chart might nudge somebody towards stereotyping, uh, first we'll look at, at stereotypes in general. So for example, uh, let, let's consider a stereotype that, that people in this purple group are especially higher earners. Uh, and, and so stereotypes assume that within a group, uh, people are more similar than they really are. And between groups, people are more different than they really are. Uh, and so the, the stereotype implies a distribution like this one on the right, where not only do people in the purple group earn more, their earnings are very similar. Uh, and therefore all purple people earn more than all other people. 
Uh, but in reality, uh, even if average earnings for people in the purple group are higher than average earnings for everyone else, uh, the distributions will still look something like the chart on the left. Uh, you can see that, that earnings are, are widely distributed within groups and that between groups, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, and this, this will generally be true for uh, any kind of social or for a lot of social outcomes, uh, especially when the groups are based on something as, as kind of loosely defined as, as race. Um, and so the, the next question uh, becomes, could certain charts create similar misperceptions? Uh, and so we'll walk through another example, this time looking at earnings for four different groups. Uh, the, the distribution on the left is close to reality for income differences uh, between something like racial groups. Uh, and uh, again, you can see that there are a lot more differences within groups than there are between groups. And so if, if we take these distributions and, and plot them as, as a bar chart of average income for each group, uh, we'd end up with a chart like this one in the middle. Uh, but when people see this bar chart, they may not imagine the distribution on the left. They may imagine something more like this. Uh, without any indication of variability, uh, it's easy to assume that, that it's not there. Uh, and just like with stereotypes, uh, charts like these can create a false impression that people within groups are more similar than they really are, and that between groups, people are more different than they really are. On the other hand, if we show these same distributions as a jitter plot or any other chart that shows the range of outcomes within groups, uh, it becomes very apparent that within groups, there's a lot of variation, and between groups, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, and this, this actually parallels real life, where the more exposure you have to, to, uh, to individual people from other groups, the easier it is to see them as, as individuals, uh, and the harder it is to, to stereotype them. And so to, to tie this back to the, the previous section, um, when we talked about uh, correspondence bias and deficit thinking, uh, we showed how somebody could go from seeing differences in outcomes uh, to beliefs about people's personal characteristics. Uh, and what we're proposing here is that there's, there's a middle step that facilitates at least part of that, where chart design can create an impression of an outcome stereotype uh, that, that leads to uh, stereotypes about personal characteristics. And so in, in our research, our, our basic hunch was that charts that emphasize within group variability, uh, like the jitter plot on the left, will help readers to see that, that outcomes are very different within groups and overlap heavily between groups. Uh, and this should reduce personal attributions or, or stereotyping. Um, on the other hand, bar charts or any other chart that, that hides outcome variability uh, should, should increase stereotyping. Um, and so we tested six different chart types showing four different topics of, of social outcome disparities. Um, and the, the charts on the left emphasize variability. Uh, these are these include jitter plots and prediction intervals. Um, you can think of a prediction interval as, as basically just kind of showing the range of, of typical outcomes. Um, it's not that exactly, but that's uh, the, the, the mental model that most people use when they see that. Um, and so the, the charts on the right uh, will, will hide variability. And, and these include bar charts, dot plots, and, and confidence intervals. And so we... that. That slide gets messed up, sorry. There you go. Uh, so we, we generally confirmed our main hunch. Uh, so across the three different experiments where we comp uh, compared high variability charts uh, uh, shown here in, in blue, like jitter plots and prediction intervals, uh, to, to low variability charts uh, here in orange, the, the bar charts, dot plots, and confidence intervals, uh, we consistently found that the charts that emphasize variability reduce stereotyping uh, relative to the charts that, that hide variability. Uh, and so that, that brings up our, our, our next takeaway, which is that when, when visualizing social inequality, uh, design choices can reinforce harmful beliefs about the people being visualized, uh, like stereotypes. Um, the, the good news, though, is, is that this gives uh, designers and chart makers and communicators uh, some control in solving for these misperceptions. Uh, for example, we can, we can show variability and then reduce tendencies towards, uh, towards stereotypes. Um, and so, so we have some choice in the matter. Um, and so it, it, it can be tempting to try to reduce outcomes into simple averages or, or easy sound bites, uh, like group X earns more than group Y. Um, and as, as communicators, our, our instincts kind of push us in that direction. We, we all value simplicity. Uh, but being overly simplistic uh, robs readers of important context. Um, and it can also make disparities worse by misleading audiences towards harmful stereotypes. And so since social outcomes are, are, are messy, uh, especially in the context of uh, big complex issues like inequality or systemic racism, uh, rather than, than chase this false simplicity, uh, our, our designs and our charts 
and our communication uh, should, should lean into the messy truth. Uh, and so the, these charts on the left are, are overly simplistic to the point of, of being misleading. Uh, when, when presenting social outcomes, uh, bar charts, dot plots, and confidence intervals, uh, these, these all emphasize between group differences and hide within group variability. Um, and this, this leads viewers to harmful conclusions about the people being visualized. Um, and so we should do less of these. On the other hand, charts like jitter plots and prediction intervals on the right, uh, these show within group variability and make it easy to see how much outcomes actually overlap between groups. Um, and this reduces tendencies to, to blame the differences uh, on the people within the groups and makes it harder to, to misread charts as evidence for harmful stereotypes. Um, and so when visualizing social outcome disparities, especially involving people from marginalized communities, uh, we want to do fewer charts that, that monolith people like these on the left uh, and more charts that show more variability like these on the right. And, and so these were, these were all of our, our takeaways. Uh, one, information can backfire. Uh, two, showing differences in outcomes uh, can be misread as, as evidence for differences between people. Uh, three is that our, our design choices matter. They, they make a difference in this. Um, they, can, they can reinforce harmful beliefs about the people being visualized. Uh, and then four is we wanna lean into the messy truth. Uh, and so this, this is, uh, the, the points that we covered in the talk are, are meant to be uh, kind of a, a, an introduction um, to, to the research and, and, and in general how social psychology can uh, uh, affect data viz. Um, but one of the things that, that I'm working on next and, and kind of excited about are, are uh, workshops or, or deeper dives or, or just uh, more research, to be honest, on uh, how we can start to apply some of this. Uh, so I, I think some of the big areas uh, that, that if you guys are involved in, uh, I'd love to hear from you, uh, would be uh, uh, public, uh, any kind of public communication of social outcomes, um, uh, so, so maybe where you guys are, are uh, publishing results from, from your studies publicly. Uh, the second is, is public health. Uh, so one of the side effects of COVID was uh, the, the dashboard epidemic, as, as, as people say. So the, the, the dual epidemics of dashboards and, and COVID. Uh, and, and I apologize to Aaron, who's actually going through uh, suffering more than, than dashboards right now. Um, uh, but these, the, the, a lot of these charts that, that, that came out uh, were, were uh, not not great, uh, and and not just for uh, kind of communities at, at risk, but uh, risky for for the the population at large. Um, and then the the third is is uh, uh, people data in the workplace. Um, so looking at the ways that that organizations kind of look at their employees. Um, I, I think there there is potential for good there, but there's also a lot of risk. Um, and so that's that's an area that that I'm I'm thinking about as well. Um, and so if if you are involved in these things, uh, I would love to talk to you. Uh, Kind of one on one from a, a research perspective. Uh, uh, if uh, if you're interested in these things, uh, I'm I'm also working on kind of workshops for these. Uh, uh, feel free to, to email me there, and and uh, I'll let you know when I have something a little bit more substantial on on the the, the applications of it. Um, and and of course, uh, my firm is three IAP. If if you're working on any public uh, visualizations of these, uh, anything that that shows social outcomes or, or uh, reflects social issues, uh, would be happy to help us there. Uh, help there as well. I'm Eli at 3IAP. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And finally, uh, uh, these uh, these three kind folks helped make uh, uh, all this happen. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to them. And I always say thank you at the end. Um, and that's all I've got. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks, Eli. That is fab what a fabulous talk. Um, just going to say, uh, uh, Eorden asked, did you look at box plots as a, another graph choice when uh, representing um, the spread of, of data as an alternate to uh, Not the other directly. graph types? Uh, I think the way that... Uh... The way that box plots would be read would be pretty similar to uh, the prediction intervals and the, the jitter plots that we that we did look at. Um, I, I suspect that uh, because they show uh, the, the the percentile ranges, um, it, it's enough to to kind of create that effect of uh, showing the the overlap uh, between groups and the the variability within groups. And so uh, box plots uh, should I would expect them to have a more alleviating effect of, of, of stereotyping. Um, mm. Box plots tend to be just as a general thing uh, can be misinterpreted in a lot of cases. So I don't I don't use them a lot personally. 
Um, I, I would probably, I would tend towards the, 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 the jitters uh, if, if you have the, the data to do it. Um, but I, I think that it is an option for, uh, for uh, reducing some of the, the, the stereotyping effect. Yeah, and Kylie had a question for, do you have any suggestions or examples um, of these types of graphs where there are real differences between groups, but not, but those differences aren't because of individual characteristics. So, for example, systemic racism or, or where there are systemic uh, structural um, inequities. Do you have uh, examples showing those specifically? Mm, I suppose examples of structural inequity. Is that what you meant, Kylie? Did you want to elaborate? Uh -huh. Hi, yeah. Um, so I work in the area of Aboriginal overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. And so, yeah, we have, we have plenty of graphs that look like this, but they do, um, like there are genuine differences between groups. Mm -hmm. it's, and when we present them like this, it reinforces that message over and over again. But how, like if, if we try and show the variability within groups, it will just reinforce that stereotype because... So the, the variability is so strong that uh, that that even if you do show uh, uh, so the, I'm sorry the, the differences are are so uh, severe that even if you show variability it, it would still wouldn't overlap. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. yeah, and I don't um, we don't know how to present this in a way that doesn't show that or reinforce that stereotype. Uh, so I've I've run into that in a couple of cases, or I, I, I've it, it seemed like I've run into that where. Uh, uh, looking at looking at geographic differences when it's kind of rolled up by uh, rolled up by something like a state or like a, a, a large geographic area, um, you you can't see as much kind of variability there. And 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 uh, for the outcomes that, that I was looking at at the time, uh, I did run into that problem where, where one group, uh, even even if you looked at them state by state, uh, didn't overlap at all with the other group. Um, and the, the the fix there was to to uh, uh, to go a, a little bit more granular and, and look at, at county level data or, or city level data or something that's a little bit smaller. Um, I don't know exactly how that would translate to, to this case, um, uh, but I, I would suspect that people are, are fundamentally similar in, in our, our behaviors and, and, and the things that we do. And, and uh, I, what I find is that, that even in the cases where, where it has kind of almost stumped me, um, if when, when I've dug a little bit deeper, like you can you can find some of the common ground. Um, I, I, I would be more than happy to to talk about that specific case, though, if if you want to uh, reach out and um, uh, we can try to figure out some ways to unpack that. Um, and just uh, from uh, Ramakrishna, do you have any? So I guess a lot of us, I, I'm pretty much just Excel, so nothing fancy. Um, we'll probably have a lot of people on on the, the line today who use um, Excel, Power BI, Tableau, perhaps. Um, I'm really curious with the jitter plots. I suspect Excel doesn't do those easily. Um, what uh, is your favorite? I have, what is your I have preference? prepared for this question specifically uh, with tutorials. Uh, oh my God, amazing. Jitter plots uh, in Excel. It is not fun, but you can do it. Uh, uh, and so I've got two little walkthroughs for uh, jitterplots in Excel or Google Sheets. Um, I think I'm, I believe that Tableau uh, and some of the other kind of more uh, uh, approachable data viz tools also uh, have, have ways of doing it pretty easily. Um, but it, at least in the Excel case, I've got a, a rough version of it. Um, and there's, there's other kind of tutorials on doing that uh, uh, kind of around the internet as well. Um, and, and I would also uh, uh, say that it doesn't have to necessarily be the jitterplot, the, the prediction intervals are kind of like showing the ranges of outcomes uh, might be uh, easier in some cases too. Uh, so that, that's uh, an option to consider as well. Oh, fabulous. Thank you all. I'm sure we'll all jump onto that later on. Um, just checking, um, are you happy to share your slides as well, Eli, with the attendees from today? Um, uh, it's a big Figma uh, design file, so it's not it's not really shared. Oh, well. I see, I see. I wonder if you could just maybe pop the um, that um, how to address in the chat, and then everyone will sort of be able to um, quickly click on it. Uh, Natalie's asked a question: Have you had uh, experience working with 
program designers or decision makers uh, to make, you know, this messy truth work. So um, to, to better inform program design or to lead to, um, you know, program improvements that sort of are more sort of going for those the core reasons for what we're seeing, not the the surface reasons, which is those personal attributions. I hope I'm getting that right, Natalie. Um, please feel free to jump on if you need to expand. Uh, thank you for sharing that link. Um, so I think the thing that gets in the way of, uh, I, I'm gonna interpret that as, as uh, kind of, how do we talk to decision makers about this and how do we use that, that data to kind of influence uh, better decisions. And, and I think the, uh, one of the things that, that gets in the way is this kind of distraction effect of uh, when, when you see that, that outcomes aren't, uh, aren't what, what you want them to be, uh, we, we jump to we jump to blame and we jump to these kind of simplistic solutions. Um, and so I think that the uh, that showing the variability and, and showing uh, and, and kind of short circuiting that first process uh, of, of kind of jumping to the blame uh, can can help get towards better solutions where better solutions are typically just like, okay, let's step back and think about what are the structural factors here? What are the environmental factors here? Uh, what, what's actually holding people back? And so, by by uh, kind of discounting the, our, our first uh, our, our first tendencies, our, our first uh, beliefs about the causes of, of kind of whatever issues we're seeing, uh, uh, we can help clarify and, and draw focus on uh, uh, solutions that, that that work because we have a better sense of what the the actual problems are. Yeah, fabulous, um, wonderful. Uh, Great, Natalie. Um, look, we've still got a bit of time. You know, don't be shy. Pop your camera on and um, ask Eli a question because I can bet your bottom dollar that there's someone else in this pool of 119 people, including myself, who will be thinking exactly the same thing. I do have uh, a couple uh, examples that, of, of looking at some more applied stuff that we could run through. If, yeah, if yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, okay. Um, so this is a chart from uh, the the uh, the Center of Disease Control in the United States. Um, and so this this chart looks at at, at uh, PrEP coverage. Um, and so PrEP, uh, for context, uh, is is a drug that's recommended for for people who might uh, be more exposed to HIV. Uh, it, it drastically reduces chances of of transmission. Um, and there's there's a big uh, national push uh, in, in the states to to try to increase coverage uh, within uh, some of the more vulnerable communities. Um, and so this chart uh, looks at PrEP coverage percentage uh, for, for three different ethnicity groups uh, relative to a goal of 50% of, uh, coverage. Um, and so the, the first thing that we can see is it, it's kind of hard to, to read. Um, and so we can, we can give it a quick facelift. Um, and, and now we can, we can see the, the, the values a little bit, uh, a little bit clearer. Um, I've also made the, the goal range kind of explicit that 50% that coverage. Um, and, and you can see that, for example, uh, white people here are at 63% coverage uh, and they're within the goal range. Um, everyone else is at 14% or lower um, and, and, and pretty far below the goal range. Um, and so this, this chart is, is generally fine for comparing a stack of percentages, um, but uh, in, any volunteers for, for how this might be misinterpreted? Uh, could I'm immediately thinking so this uh, doing that personal attribution bias that uh, people from within the black Latino and I think this other people category always gets me um, uh, for, they're, they're disinclined to come forward for prep so they're not seeking prep and then there's a I guess that uh, deficit judgment to oh why aren't they like is the, or you know like why aren't they seeking mm -hmm. prep uh whereas i guess a environmental interpretation might be that or that prep is uh, more easily accessible and and or available to people who are um uh, to the white population in comparison to other population groups, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so the one of the risks is the stereotyping risk of, of people can, can read this as uh, behavioral. Uh, and so like it can be misread as uh, maybe, maybe white people take uh, better care of their health or, or care more about it. Or that's, that's uh, one way this can kind of go, go wrong. Um, the other, uh, you also mentioned an external attribution, which is uh, maybe access is different. Um, and that's, that turns out to actually not be the case here. Uh, uh, so th there's a few issues with this. One is it's, it's kind of confusing because of the, the metric uh, that they're using. Uh, the, the metric is, is based on uh, percent of the, uh, the, the people who are, uh, who are vulnerable, not, not the percent of the population. Um, and so it, it kind of creates this impression that, uh, that, that more, uh, you, you might read this as, as saying uh, more white people use PrEP than people of color, uh, but that's actually not the case. Um, uh, and then uh, we mentioned the stereotypes, that's, that's another uh, issue. Um, and I think the, a, a third issue is, is maybe uh, relevant for you guys, uh, which is uh, this I think could have a backfire effect in actually reducing adoption. Um, and so if you're a person of color and you read this, you may think that PrEP is for white people, it's, it's not for me. Um, and so this, uh, 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 maybe for you guys, is, is to the extent that the, the programs that you're evaluating are, are successful, um, uh, you, you may want to uh, kind of be considerate around how you show what, what appears to be social norms. Um, and so this is, uh, this is based on, on uh, a, a research project that we just wrapped up a couple months ago. Um, but it, it seems like generally, if, if people see that something is rejected by their in-group, uh, they're more likely to reject it as well. Um, and mm -hmm. so you might expect that, that people of color who see this uh, uh, would become actually more resistant to using PrEP them, uh, themselves uh, because it, it seems like nobody else like them is, is, is using it, but that's, that's actually not the case. Um, mm -hmm. And it becomes a little bit clearer when you look at a different, uh, a different way of calculating these same metrics. Um, so this is, this is still looking at, at kind of PrEP usage uh, but instead of the, the previous metric that was looking at uh, usage per kind of like most at risk population, this is just looking at PrEP usage uh, per 100,000 people uh, in the population at, at all. Um, and so what, what this kind of clarifies is that uh, it, it, it's actually not, not differences in usage, uh, it's, it's differences in, in, in burden. Um, and so the uh, this, this switches a metric, uh, uses a, a metric with a kind of like more intuitive denominator, which is uh, which scales with the population. Uh, here we we're also using the the jitter plots uh, to show geographic averages, uh, which should accomplish some of the uh, showing variability within groups and and overlap between them. Um, and then using the goal ranges to show uh, uh, here's here's ideally where we would like to be, um, and instead of having that baked directly into the metric. Um, and so what you can see here is that the the behaviors uh, between groups are actually very similar. It's just that uh, to, to reach our, our kind of public health goals uh, for, uh, for uh, Black and, and Latino people, we just, we have a lot more work to do um, because they, they have, a, a, there, there's a higher burden there. Um, and and that's, that's kind of the, the, the general idea is any, any chance we can get to uh, show that, that, show what people have in common, uh, show that, that we, we all are behaviorally generally pretty similar um, but it, it's it's our environments that it's our environments and, and kind of what we're up against that that can be uh, a, 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 that can make a big difference. Um, mm. um, just switching, just uh, switching over to another question. The audience asked a great one, actually. Uh, a lot of us uh, often deal with categorical variables, um, so a quantitative plot like jitter is um, probably not going to work. So how yeah. might we sort of better present our categorical variables, perhaps? So uh, this one actually is, is a good example of that. Uh, so uh, prep usage is, is a binary, is binary, like you, you are a user or not. Um, and the, the way to show uh, variability here is, uh, it, it, so the, the, the kind of the averages here are, are still kind of the, the global average. Uh, but here, each dot is uh, a, a geographic, a, a smaller kind of geographic region. Um, so this is a, a state. Um, so in this case, you, uh, you can see that uh, Black people in Florida have the, the highest rates of, of kind of prep usage. Um, and so by uh, kind of 
summarizing the uh, binary or, or categorical variables up to uh, a, a smaller geographic area, you can you can use the uh, the geographic variance uh, to show kind of what people have in common. And and the a, a, a nice uh, a, a additional effect of this uh, is that it does highlight how much uh, geography can can play a, a, a huge role in in the, the differences in, in outcomes like these. Um, and so the, the the trick of kind of rolling up to uh, 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 rolling up to a small geographic unit um, is is a good way to to show variability with with binary or categorical uh, uh, inputs. Oh. Did, um, was that helpful, Jordan? Did you have anything else you had in mind? 